65th running of the total 24 hours of Spa is round four of the Blancpain Endurance Series. Welcome to a sunny Belgium. It hasn't been like this all day necessarily. It was pretty wet this morning. We had a very wet Formula 3 race, for example. Track temperature now, though, 39.9 degrees. It's a pretty humid day, but the sun has burst through. The track is dry. There's a light breeze. There's a big crowd on hand as well to watch the Blue Ribbon GT event. And for 65 years, the Spa 24 Hours has been delivering great racing. It began for uh, touring cars, effectively, now very much for GT cars. And a 65-strong entry is going to be getting underway very shortly indeed. Well, always a highlight of the Spa 24 Hours weekend is not just the race, but it is pretty much a week-long event that begins on the Wednesday with the parade into town. The cars leave the circuit, they make their way in convoy around the circuit itself and then down the roads into Francochamps itself. It's a chance for the spectators to get up close and personal to the cars and when they arrive in Francochamps town then there's the opportunity for all the fans to have a look even closer at the cars and to get some autographs as well. It's a chance to have McLarens, Nissans, Porsches for example all on the road if they look a little bit incongruous as they thread their way around the streets around the circuit, well, it is certainly something that the fans love, and it's also part of the appeal of the event. And when not just cars from this championship, but the support races as well roll into town, there's always an enormous gathering. The fans, many aficionados of the sport, many quizzical to find out what all the commotion is about. And you go and get posters and stickers and collect autographs. There are interviews with the drivers done as well. This, of course, putting a big smile on the face of the championship promoter, Stefan Rattel. Mark VDS Racing, one of the Belgian teams keen for success. Pro Speed as well, the local Porsche team, also with an opportunity to score victory. And then it's chance for all the drivers to go to a very busy driver's briefing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the 65th edition of the Total 24 Hours of Spa. The driver's briefing is a little bit like football stadium in a sense it's so full then all the drivers gather outside for the customary photograph and then they have to drive back again and then the teams have to go to work and get the cars ready for free practice that kicks off Thursday at the end of the day there is qualifying and then night qualifying and on Friday there is super pole many of them are worn out even before they get to the race itself and as the grid now starts to form of course down there we have the leading drivers and we had a chance earlier in the week to catch up with some of the drivers Audi, as ever, is a brand to beat in the total 24 hours of Spa. Winners for the last two years, and Laurence Vantour will start 20th on the grid. This race is the biggest GT3 race in the world at the moment. Uh, it's true that the last couple of years the Audi R8 won a lot of 24 hour races, including two times this one. But this year we are struggling a bit. Uh, I think we don't have the performance of the car in our, in our favor uh, due to some, uh, some restrictions. So it will be a hard job, but it's a Belgian race for the Belgian team, the Belgian Audi Club supporting us. Winning this race would mean a lot to me and, uh, and to the team. Every year we expect great things out of Mark VDS Racing with Maxime Martin behind the wheel of the BMW Z4. This could be the year in which they win. We have a really good team, a really good car, um, a really good teammates. So I think we really have the chance to, to win and to do, to do good results. Now we know that 24 hours is really long. Uh, you need to have a, a bit luck. You need to have constant pace. You need to have a lot of things to win. Every brand wants to, to win and everybody is pushing. It will be difficult for sure, but uh, yeah, I think we have a good chance to, to be there. You expect the Nissans to be competitive, but the JRM cars really struggled in qualifying. Lucas Law will start 49th on the grid. 24 hours is not about a quick lap time. It's about uh, having a good, uh, quick, constant car for, for throughout the race. It's a fun track. It's a, it's a good length. You have all kinds of corner combinations. And we, do, we drivers, we like that. I think everybody who, who is going to watch it, they will have an exciting and very eventful race. Peter Cox has won the race outright in the past. This year, he's after honours in the Pro-Am category, driving the Blanc Pan Racing and Bikini. For sure, a 24-hour race is always tough, and uh, the Spa-Francorchamps circuit is demanding. And uh, like a 24 hour is always demanding on the, on the equipment, the material, the drivers, the team. For everybody, even for the organisation, the people from TV, for everybody, I think it's a, it's a very long and hard race. Championship leader David Irigon knows he needs points out of this race. An outright win may not be possible, but he needs a good points haul at the end of 24 hours. 
will be fantastic to win this race for me, for my teammate, for the team Kessel. So let's hope and uh, support us. The Senna name is on the grid for the total 24 hours of Spa. Bruno Senna, who turned his back on Formula One, drives for the Von Rahn racing team aboard a McLaren and he really wants to win. 24 hour race is a whole different uh, uh, world of the Formula One racing. It's uh, very long. You don't really understand the race until the later hours of the race and you have to really push very hard to uh, to try and uh, make sure you finish it. The aim is to really just uh, get into the car, get into the track and uh, make sure I learn as much as possible. But you know, we are working, everybody is racing for a win and uh, it would be awesome to be at least in the podium in this race, it would be amazing. There's more Belgian support for Bertrand Baguette as well. He's a local driver, he's got one of the 2012 spec Aston Martins and he too is keen for a good result. For me it's very important because I live 20 minutes from here, uh, still I am young, I come uh, I come here every day, every every week, so I know this track like my pocket. No, it's very important for me. I have a lot of fans here, a lot of supporters, so I really want to get this race on my CV. Right after Le Mans, it would be, would be incredible. And in the 50th year of the Porsche 911, can the Belgian Pro Speed team bring its Porsche home victorious? They have an early stop-go penalty to serve, but they have a quick driver in Marco Holzer. It's a real big race for us, uh, for the team. It's, um sure with the Belgium uh, fans what we have around here and uh, all the guys are coming from from Bro Speed and it's a big show for us and we want to give them a good show and that stop go penalty that has to be served between the ends of lap uh, number one to lap number four is because of an engine change and because you change the engine uh, after the event has started that gives you this stop go penalty well back in 2010 where we had a Porsche victory. The Spa 24 Hours was the predecessor of Blancpain, and Stefan Rattel is here to talk about it. Stefan Rattel, this is your event. A fabulous grid, a beautiful day. What are you hoping for? I'm hoping for a great race. I think we have all the ingredients together for a fantastic edition. I think the best in the history of the event. Never in history the 24, the total 24 hours has had such a grid in number, in quality, in diversity, and in number of cars that can really win. Looks to me like this is a battle of the German manufacturers to some extent, do you think so? I think Aston Martin has a chance. I think Ferraris, you have some Ferraris very well driven, which have a chance as well. The Nissan has been disappointing uh, in qualifying, but has definitely the driver lineup to make it. Uh, so it's going to be very open and I think, uh, I think it's going to be exciting. <laughs> Let's have a look at certainly some of the brands, some of the cars to keep an eye to. On the left as you look is the pole position, Aston Martin. Stefan Mucker to start and alongside is going to be Alessandro Piedjuini. And as the marshals duck out of the way, the second row of the grid, we've got Max Goetz and Nick Katzberg in the BMW. Then is Nick Tandy starting in the Porsche, Matt Griffin alongside him. The yellow and white Aston is that of Bertrand Baguette, Maxime Martin is alongside. The lemon and lime Manti Porsche, Mark Lieb goes first, Alvaro Perret for Hexis is alongside. Then Alexander Frolov and in the Ferrari, Marco Ciocci. The number 25 BMW, started by Ludovic Bade, Thomas Jaeger in the Mercedes. Then Alex Bunkham, quickest in the warm up, Raffaele Giamaria in the Ferrari. Peter Copt, previous winner in the Lamborghini, Frank Keckler for Vita 4 1. Then the Porsche of Franck Pereira and the Audi number one, Rene Rast, last year's winner, will go first. A fabulous grid, I'm sure you'll agree, with these nine different brands represented. And people have been making the point from the grid, some of the best drivers in the world. The cars then come out of that source, 65 GT3 cars about to be unleashed then, the pace car as it is peels into the pit lane, the pace quickens, the cars then with the lights on red make their way slowly, slowly, slowly up towards the line, we hit half past four, the lights go green, the pace quickens, everybody blasts away, it's going to be Stefan Mucker who tries to get the lead, but right alongside of his Piedjuini who gets his nose in front on the outside line, Stefan Mucker on the inside, Piedjuini spins at the very first corner, one of the BDS BMWs goes off in avoidance, there are cars everywhere, and on cold tyres, Alessandro Piedjuini could very nearly have caused mayhem. That was the very question I asked him on the grid, are you going to go side by side through the corner with Stefan Mucha and what happens he tries to he gets on the outside of the corner and around she goes hi oh, that was an avoidance amazing well they've all survived just about as they come towards they can't some will have lost track position because of that but the key thing is they're still going and Alessandro Piedjuini really should have known better look you're in a race lights go out side by side you think you've got the advantage if you can hold the outside in the first part of Eau Rouge up to Radio you'll be on the inside as you come onto the Camel Street and you can gain that position but 
you know, 24 hours, not 24 milliseconds. And he could very nearly have wiped out others, so it's a shuffled order. The cars turning their way through Brussels for the first time already. Some of the back markers just dropping away, but look at this as they turn their way downhill out of the so-called speaker's corner. The leaders are going through Pouin, and don't forget that not only has Pierre Schmidi had a spin, he's also got to serve a drive-through, because yesterday in the Super Bowl he was out after his allotted time, so he's, he's already got a self-imposed penalty from today, as well as one from yesterday. Well, he's had two of the lemons uh, in the space of 24 hours. Hopefully, <laughs> he will not have a further one, but maybe this will allow we are no easy cars to slow down, just the fact of just going slightly wide coming through the S's. But it is always a difficult moment with a field of 66 cars trying to get through uh, and not literally bump or bang into one another. Looking back to the number 35 Nissan there, that's the car that's being started by Lucas Ordoniet as the field turns its way then for the first time towards the bus stop, heading up towards the end of lap number one. Battles rage on right the way through the field as this multi-million Euro grid goes through and a spin already for the number nine McLaren, and that is the car being started by Mike Wainwright, the man that foots the bill, the gentleman racer. It doesn't look like it's going an awful lot further either. That car looks like it's come to a stop, and uh, we have to wait and see. Into the pit lane comes Nick Tandy, so the 911, 911, because it's number 911, comes down the pit lane to serve this one minute stop go penalty. Well, the good thing is he'll get that out of the way, and significantly by doing it now, of course, John, he will remain on the lead lap. Yes, indeed. You get it out of the way, get back into the race. He'll probably rejoin the race pretty more, not quite on the tail of the field, I suspect, but uh, get it served, get it over and done with, settle down, and let this race then take its course. Now, Stefan Mucha leads Nick Katzberg after amazing avoidance, runs second. Third is Alvaro Parent, fourth is Maxime Martin. Fifth is Max Gertz, and then in sixth place is number 73, which is Alex Frolov in another of the SMP racing Ferrari that also has to serve a drive-through. And after his spin, where is Pierre Juidi? He's down in 15th place, and you can spot him because he's the man with a really red face now. Well, I tell you what, I mean, he's only dropped from second to 15th as a miracle. That's almost a result in itself. You can almost imagine the shouts in race control as the race director saw what was going on and thought, oh, bloody, look at this. But they've all survived as the field powers up the pedal straight there, but going to the inside line, the Pro Speed 75 Porsche with Maxime Soule, Belgian driver at the wheel of it. And I just get the feeling that the Porsches are worth watching in this race, that many of those worst drivers not just here for the good of their health. And lower down the order, look, number five, uh, the McLaren in the hands of Greg Gilbert tries to gain ground. Everywhere you look, there's a gaggle of cars all squabbling for track position. Going to replay of the start. Well, we know what the outcome is, but John, talk us through this. Well, as I said, side by side into turn one, what are you going to do, Pierre Luigi? And he just said, no, no problem. Then all of a sudden, he's on the outside of the corner. It's dirtier there. We've had other races here. Spins across the front of the field. Fortunately, everybody had the chance to realize there was an incident. They got one side, one the other side. Some had to go off track and were left on the right. But everybody pretty much got through unscathed. And uh, a deep breath for uh, the Ferrari. And all the way down the order, you've got cars that you might think should be doing better than they are, but it's just such a strong entry as well. That's what is making it difficult. Marcus Winkelhock in the red and white out in number 16 at the head of that little gaggle goes through. Also in there, number 12, Gregoire de Moustier, and already Rene Rast in the number one Audi being warned about respecting the track limits. Have a look at this, because now you've got the ART McLaren coming powering uphill under real, real pressure. The Von Ryan car, Bruno Senna at the wheel, just strolls on by. Yeah, I and mean, Bruno Senna first time in a McLaren MP4-12C and said before this event what a great honour it was to drive for a McLaren or in a McLaren team. And Davey Ryan, of course, who owns and runs this team, very much a part of McLaren for well, decades. Now he runs his own private MP4-12C in the Blanc Plan Championship and Bruno Senna drafted in and uh, getting his first flavour of a car that, of course, is... Well, what can you say about his uncle? And look at this, coming out of the bus stop now. Alvaro Perret third, and Max Goetz gets ahead of him. He's on the outside line for La Source. Can the Mercedes move across and squeeze the McLaren? We go on board with Maxi Martin as they head down to the hairpin, but Perrent on the inside line gets back ahead once again, and Max Goetz really hustling on in the Mercedes. Now four of them have all concertinaed up, coming out of the corner on the back of that little group is Matt Griffin, and they're also, John, coming up on traffic. Indeed, coming down to Eau Rouge, Alvaro Perrent gets through. Maximilian Goetz gets through. Everybody else a little bit more cautious. Oh, and that is a big off for the Nissan. 32 is in the wall with some force. And that is Alex the car Bunkham. with Alex Bunkham at the wheel of it. And that's at the top of a room. That is. is a big impact. And that's out. It's ripped the wheel off the And car. that's going to probably see the first safety car intervention because it's at a hazardous part of the racetrack. Alex Bunkham is out of the car. We don't know what caused that, but that's a big impact into the tower wall. That's probably the most critical and maybe the quickest part of the... Just after the apex, Alex Bunkham has been winded. You can see him just walking away now. Suddenly, they, 
affects the adrenaline that he got a massive shoulder he knows that that was a heavy impact yeah. and wants to get to safety behind the tower barrier let's look at it it's comes time him. all on his own turn oh, on the back end just suddenly oh wheels come off wheels come off have a look wow the left rear wheel had come down here we go. Let's look have again. A, have a look as it spins, and you'll see a wheel. As the car spins around, the wheel is going underneath the car. Here it goes. It spins now, and look at that rear wheel. It's folding under the car. Yes, it's you're right. Absolutely. Well, good, good look. That's well done. And nuts come off as well. I'm pretty sure as it started the spin, a loose wheel, and as the car spins that's around, so it drags mm. it underneath. Very unusual. And Katzberg looks to go down the inside, back side of it, but clear. He's getting closer, and they're getting yeah. good drive off that source. Can put him into a position to throw Rouge to then have a challenge up, come all straight up into Lake Coombe. And while they're squabbling like this, Maxi Martin, who is up into third, he's not that far adrift. That gap is coming down as well. Second to third, so it won't be long, I think, before we've got the three leaders together. Good run off Rouge from Nicky Katzberg. He ran wide on the exit at Radio, but he's probably going to get away with it. Comes out, gets alongside, but can he maintain that outside position when he gets on the brakes? Here they come, up to Lecom, inside for the Aston, outside for the BMW, the Aston Martin, he's going to turn in ahead. Nick Katzberg tries to stay alongside him, but he's gone through, he's gone all over the curb because he got squeezed, he gets back on ahead of the Aston Martin that's got the momentum to go back ahead. Fantastic stuff, Stefan Mucker comes out ahead. They've delayed themselves and dropped back from Nick Tandy, but Katzberg is not done yet as he tries the inside line at Brussels and once again, Mucker closes the door, then he goes wide. BMW tries to shove his nose up the inside, and once again, Nick Katzberg is not so much hung out to dry, but he's certainly on the wrong line going into the next left-hander. You've got to be really good at this to get past Stefan Mucker, haven't oh, you? Yeah. I mean, he, he did it all right, coming through a rouge, got the run through the corner, up over Rabion, was quicker, got alongside the ass and on the straight, but couldn't make it stick. Mucker on the inside, Katzberg tries to go the long way around, ran out of road, ran off the racetrack, had to concede regardless whether he, he did or not. He had, at this point, he had to let the ass and get ahead because he was off the racetrack. Stefan Mucker knows that, just drives around the outside, and this is going to be really just a battle between the Aston Martin team and uh, Mark VDS BMW. And it looks to me like the BMW team is probably going to win this one. And there might be a positional change in the pit lane. You're it right. is. The BMW have got it done. So they have taken that position away. There is the Aston Martin. And this is a slow stop indeed. When this is going to cost them positions. Very go now. disappointing for Aston. Yeah, it's a slow stop, isn't it? As you say, a long stop. Look at this, Tandy oh, trying to lap me. the Ferrari, Katzberg trying to lap Nick Tandy, up to the bus stop they come, and the only way this is going to end well, I think, is for one of them to make a pit stop, that is not Nick Tandy, and it, it is, is Nick Maxime. Katzberg. Well, Katzberg, yes. Katzberg in, so the leader, oh, and, and Perrette and third, fourth, fourth. <laughs> yeah, they're they're all following in. and everybody else behind. In has come Ludovic Bade, I think I'm right in saying, yep, he has, and also in Frank Keckler, so that jumbles your order a bit more, doesn't it? It's going to make it interesting because, again, it's going to be a battle of the teams in the pit lane. We saw that BMW, the Mark VDS team, did a great job to cycle uh, Maxi Martini and get him out ahead of the Aston. They had a difficult slow pit stop. So a driver change taking place. Maxi Martin out of the car. I think Nicky Katzberg, I should say, out of the car. Now look at the Porsche coming down towards us. Mark Lieb brought in the Manti Porsche, and that is very close to pit out. So you get back into the car, you've got a downhill start. He's got ahead of Alvaro Pared. Look, the Hexis McLaren's away pretty slowly. So the Porsche have done a good job. And uh, second of the BMWs as well. That's put Lieb ahead of Katzberg, look, because there's number four, which has fallen back behind the Manti Porsche. So the race leader on that pit stop, Nick Katzberg brought it in. He's lost out. And remember Stefan Mucker, um, 18th. But another car off, and is that Peter Cox's Lamborghini? It is 24, I think. It's Jos Menten that's taken the car over. Over at Radio again, top of Eau Rouge. Big impact. Another, and that's going to be another safety car intervention. We didn't see what caused that one, but certainly, again, if you hit, don't hit it on the left-hand side, just after the apex, you'll lose it, and you'll go straight out to the right and into that tower barrier. Safety car. It's the second safety car, it's another accident, it's number 24, and it's Jos Menten, a previous winner of the event, who has gone off the road, and I would also suggest not only safety car, but another retirement. That looks like a retirement, and again, you can see just to the, for the flag, just to the right of the flag, the marks on the racetrack, and that car's had a heavy impact, it's been a high speed, off, and uh, of course, there's a, a lot of tarmac, the reality is it doesn't actually slow the car down hugely, usually it gets very dusty when it's not a part of the actual racetrack and uh, the car just skids pretty much 
at speed into the tire barrier. We don't know the circumstances. Maybe let's look and see what happens. Uh, Hits the well, curb. Hits the curb. Just, you know, just loses it pretty much on his own behind two other cars. But it's the impact which takes him from left right into the tire barrier. Tire barrier does a good job, but yeah. nonetheless, it's a heavy impact. And that is almost a carbon copy of Edward Sandstrom's demise from the race last year. In the early hours of Sunday morning, he did that. He hit the curb going through that part, which unsettled the car. And the only outcome was he was going to hit those tyres, and that put him out of the race. And I think we've just witnessed another retirement. I still think, I know we didn't really talk about predicting a winner, John, before the race, but I still think the 150 Manti Porsche is a potential winning car, and it's now running second overall and leading the Pro Cup. Well, I mean, as I mentioned to Stefan Rotel when we had that interview on the grid, I said this is really a battle, a race of a battle of the four major German manufacturers, yeah. and of course. There are other manufacturers in this race as well, but the level of, of driving that are in the Mercedes, the BMW, the Audis, and the Porsche, really outstanding quality drivers are coming up into uh, the Blanchemont. It, it, oh, nearly overrunning into the back of the, the Porsche, and having then to drive around the McLaren while not really managing to do it, but part of the frustration for the BMW as it accelerates. And again, look at the pace of the McLaren just off the corner, slightly better positioned. Now you've got to make a brave maneuver down the inside, on the inside line, you can get alongside, and the pass is a nice clean pass. But it, it, it's part of the give and take, and um, I mean, it would be great to see a Ferrari or the Aston or any of the other manufacturers, even the Nissan, that had terrible issues in the early part of the race. As this race progresses, that we see other manufacturers outside of those four German giants uh, have some role in the outcome of this race. Everywhere you look, there's just gaggles of cars all batting together. Ricard Leeds is under attack, isn't he? Because now he's got Maxime Martin on one side, he's got Marcus Paltzer on the other. And which of the BMWs is going to find a way past? One or both, they're both going to have a go at Ricard Leeds. And they both go through. Martin goes ahead, Paltzer goes ahead. There's traffic in there as well. Look, you've got the Flexibox Ferrari. And so Ricard Leeds loses two places. And that means that now second overall is Martin, third overall is Paltzer. But more significantly, perhaps, this now has shuffled the top three within the pro. Up and look at the background. Stefan Mucker is on a mission. Absolutely, he's caught back up to this group of cars. He lost that time in the uh, pit stops, but due to the safety car intervention, that's put him back into contention. And uh, that Aston Martin has got a lot of performance, and uh, we expect to see it in these next few laps. The fight for second place continues, then nose to tail right. Here comes Patrick Pile at the inside. He's got the best line for Lecon. This should give the Porsche second place. He's on the inside line, but Henri Moser stands his ground on the outside. Is he going to lose the place? He does. At the inside comes Pile. Good move. Yeah, but Moser opened the door and said, look, here's the road. Take the middle of the racetrack. What was he doing opening the door in that way? He got past the Nissan. He should have stayed in the middle of the racetrack and forced Pile to go the long way around coming down Kemmel Street. We saw how Moser made it very easy for Pile some laps ago, and again the Porsche goes to the left of the racetrack trying to find a gap which currently is being occupied by a fellow Porsche. One moves over so the Porsches gain something. So Porsche on the outside, BMW on the inside, and yes, swoops through and takes the lead. Good move by Pile, four abreast going up to Lecon, the leaders and the back markers. And so now we have a Porsche up front because Patrick Pile leads the total 24 hours of Spa, but back onto his tail. Yelma Berman wants that place. Also running with them, Xavier Mars, and they're in 40th position, three laps down. And as they turn their way now through Brussels, we've got Pile ahead of Berman, ahead of Moser. The three of them running together as they head off downhill. Now, can the Porsche break away? Now, you don't have to watch what's going on on the circuit. You can, if you so desire, go, and this is near Eau Rouge, down to many of the places to get something to eat and drink. There's the fun fair down there, there are shops, there's the concert that's going to be getting underway a little bit later on. So the event, underline the word event, not just race, geared up for everybody. Yeah, and I think that's, again, the whole concept of 24-hour races, be it in Europe and North America, wherever, is about entertainment and the fans come here. And you don't have to sit and watch for 24 hours, you can dip in and out as your fancy takes you. And uh, I mean, I always thought this was part of the race that when I visited a 24-hour race way back in the early 60s, was the most magical thing I'd ever seen in my life. Because to see cars racing with the light as it is right now, it's not fully dark yet, but it's not light enough to you have to run with your lights on. And it, it is magical, there's no question about it. GT racing right now is very healthy indeed. Other forms of sports car racing are sort of ebbing and flowing. And I think if you can find yourself into a strong team that's well financed and has got old manufacturing problem there. That's the Beach Dean Aston. Yeah, right or left front. 
Was it a wishbone or was it a suspicion? Well, it looks like a wheel's locked. Yeah, but it's also low, isn't it, on it that is corner? Low. That Johnny like Adam a, behind the wheel. That might be a suspension rather than a wheel tire. Well, down the pit lane it comes, but this was the car on pole position, don't forget. And within the Pro-Am Cup, one with a good chance of a decent result. Now, I'm afraid it's going to lose some time on this pit stop. This is another one for Jack to go and investigate, isn't got it? got one tyre there. Let's have a look and see if we can catch what the problem is. There's the car coming very slowly. You can see sparks as bodywork also came off the car. I mean, it, uh, the wheel wasn't rotating. Now, whether that's because it was locked when he had mm. trying to slow the car down or whether the wheel itself is locked, but goodness me, there you can see it. Loads. I think there's something... I'm not... I think the... Uh, that's more than just a flat tyre. Yeah. It isn't even... Well, they put a tyre on, was it? It was the old one, isn't I it? I suspect that there's a mechanical... You can see the bodywork has also been damaged as the car was being dragged. Now, Jack has got more news. Jack, all yours. Basically, there was a, a, a tyre failure, uh, they think, or, or rather a tyre explosion from where a piece of carbon fibre or something had almost split straight into the tyre. When you look at the tyre, it's not deflated in the normal puncture way and delaminated all the way around. It's kind of there's just one slice through it. The rest of the tyre is fully intact. It's very bizarre. So Johnny Adam was at the wheel and, uh, and he said he was just coming into the braking zone and, and had to stop. OK, Jack, for the moment, thanks very much. We're looking at Marco Holzer, who has stopped out on the track. He was in 28th place, but this is a pro-speed Porsche, and it's a significant Porsche that he's off the road, and he's a long way off the road down at Stavolo. And so I'm afraid to say that looks like the end for the 911-911. And pro-speed, again, the Belgian team, which came into the race with high hopes, has had trouble for 75, continuing troubles for 911, and that is a big, big shame. Six laps down is the gentleman trophy leading Ferrari with Patrice Goyla at the wheel. And one of these sets of headlights is it coming into Lecon. There it is, number 20, run by the Sofrev team, Jérôme Polycon's team, and Patrice Goyla, along with the Jean-Lucs, Bobelic and Blanchiment, and also for that car for this race, another man that's a double winner, Fred Bouvy. He was, in fact, the man that used to win in the Peugeot 306 days we talked about earlier on, uh, now behind the wheel of a Ferrari for the weekend, and it's leading the Gentleman Trophy. So Sofrev have taken over the class lead against Sport Garage after... Stefan Leray was leading a little while ago. We are aware of a number of retirements. I think we've lost now seven cars officially from the race. These days, the teams do have to officially declare the car a retirement, and seven teams have done just that. There are others that are stranded out on the circuit, which I think will, in the fullness of time, go through the system and be officially declared as retirements. This stage of the race has been a little quieter than the original three hours, but still, <laughs> Thank still well, yes, you say, but still we have this battle royal raging on between the two Mark VDS BMWs that survive and the Manti Racing Porsche. But this dark horse looming over them is the HTP uh, Mercedes in the hands at the moment of Bert Schneider running in fourth, and Frank Keckler is in fifth place in the Vita 4-1 BMW. He's a lap back, but that's perhaps not the end of the world for that car. And if that can stay there or thereabouts, that could also come good near the end. As far as the championship is concerned, after six hours with those half points awarded, it's still Ramos, Regan and Zampieri ahead, but Boerman lined as a Martin a little bit closer. Edward Sandstrom is now third, ahead of Mies and Stippler, with Dumbreck, Kane and Lure the next team within the Pro Cup. Of course, some of the teams that are new to the championship for the weekend taking points away from the regulars, so that is something else that they have to be aware of. But that is how it looked at the moment in the championship at the head of the Pro Cup. Then you've got Darren Turner and Fred Makaviki and Stefan Mucker, the head of Steph Dusseldorp, Alvaro Parent and Alexander Sims. But a bad day at the office for Stefan Ortelli, Rene Rast and Lawrence Van Tour. No points for them, but a good haul for Moser Paltela and for Nick Katzberg. And now, as we come to six minutes past eight local time, the race order looks very different indeed. First of all, let's see who is where, then we'll catch up on what's happened during the night, because now with 366 laps done, Ben Schneider, Maximilian Buch, Maximilian Goetz lead the way from Mark Lieb, Richard Leeds and Patrick Pile. And the car that led the championship coming into this race in the Pro Cup, David Rigon, Cesar Ramos and Daniel Zampieri now run third. Fourth, the Audi of Andre Lotterer, Christopher Mies and Frank Stippler, ahead of the surviving BMW now, Stefano Colombo, Greg Franchi and Frank Keckler. 
six, Harold Primat, Oliver Jarvis and Christopher Hasse. And this is the Pro Cup you're looking at, not the overall order, because seventh overall is where you find now the leading Pro-Am car, and that is Ferrari number 70 being hustled along in the hands of Alexander Sriabin. But I'm afraid that within the Pro Cup, we've lost quite a few of them, and significantly out of both of the remaining. But Mark VDS BMWs, we'd lost number 14 last night. Number three has retired. A fire extinguisher failed, and in turn, that damaged the electrics. That car is out. And number four BMW also out with electrical problems, possibly an alternator, the team thinks. Bass Linders has tweeted the fact that these aren't BMW parts, and something has gone wrong. It's sad to say, what could have been the dream result for the Mark VDS team is no more. But we've got now eight hours and 19 minutes of the race to go. One or two have not yet woken up to the drama, but the sun is shining. It has dawned a gorgeous day at Spa. However, there is the threat, as ever, of some rain within really the next hour or so. What a shame those two BMWs looked so strong yep. when we went off air last night at, what, 11 o'clock? in the evening and uh, certainly the battle of the four German manufacturers now has come down to a battle really of two with Mercedes-Benz leading and a great job from uh, Bernd Schneider. That car now in second place because of the overlaps and on the, the pit stops, the Mercedes being an early stopper in the first stint. And it's now Richard Leitz and the Porsche and number 150 that is back in the lead of this race. So the Porsche, which has had the change of brake pads at 20 past six this morning. That cost it some time, but it's going very strongly. That is the 911 numbered Porsche 911 GT3R, which has recently had a puncture that goes back into the race. And 75 has also, for Pro Speed, had tyre dramas. This just a couple of minutes ago. This was the Henrici Marsen Sule car heading towards the pit lane. 13 the car had been dragged up to, and it had Xavier Marsen at the wheel of it, but that puncture obviously losing time, and the car dragged back into the pit lane. Hopefully, not too much damage done as a consequence of that. Now there, 35, is Peter Pizzera. You're on board with him now, and this is the surviving Team RJN car. 13th overall and 5th in class. You're on board with Pizzera now as he drops downhill, the man that won the German uh, Academy within the Nissan GT PlayStation Academy competition last year. 25 years of age, an industrial mechanic, and the way that he drives, and to be fair, this is true of all of the winning graduates of the PlayStation Academy, he belies his lack of experience. Well, I think, I mean, I've been impressed, and I've been cynical as well, because I think you have kids that sit in front of TV screens playing, you know, motor circuit games or whatever you call them, the GTM Academy. It's a very much more sophisticated product than simply how I've explained it. But it does illustrate, and we talked about it again last night, the, the correlation between that type of product and where teams advanced development of, of race car simulators are now so that uh, what you're seeing Peter Pizzera and others do that have come through the academy is actually just a, a short window for what potentially is the future for many young drivers they will see this as being the first step not going into karting not having your, your dads that want to have their sort of heart on their sleeve through their son's performance or daughter's performance for that matter but the GT Academy can offer an alternative route and a lot less expensive one as well. This is the lead battle at one of the most spectacular circuits the championship visits. Most circuits with hills are spectacular. There are plenty of hills at Spa. A sideways Porsche powers out of the bus stop. And now it's a drag race down to La Source. As up the outside goes uh, Maximilian Book. Is that going to give him the race lead? Well, yes, it does briefly because he has his nose in front. But Patrick Pile breaks even later on the inside. He turns into La Source ahead and he hangs on to the race lead. But he goes wide. And now the Mercedes, with all of that grunt, comes up alongside as they plunge downhill once again. This is going to give us a new race leader. The Mercedes should go through and does go through at the bottom of the hill. Simply nothing more or less than the fresher rubber on the Mercedes and Porsche, really. You could see how much it struggled for grip as it came out of the bus stop chicane. It did manage to get its nose back in front as it went into the source herpen, but fundamentally the tyre on the Porsche is at the end of its useful life. And the Mercedes has got fresher tyres, it's got more pace, it's got more weight on board with the fuel that they had to fill the car up with. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's better to have the grip and the weight than have no weight and no grip. Well, here we are on board with the Ferrari coming up to this stop go and he lets the other car get through there in fact under braking 
uh, the bus stop chicane, which sadly is the, the poorest corner on the circuit. Nothing like the old bus stop, very much a chicane these days, rather than the uh, left-right flick, then a small slip road, and then another right-left flick to get you out of the bus stop. That's how it used to be. Dennis Anderson, whoops, with a bit of correction needed, floors the throttle, that's pretty dramatic. Where's the traction control then? <laughs> Probably turned off. This battle for fourth and fifth places has just changed because you've now got Cesar Ramos ahead of Stefano Colombo. So what you're looking at is a reversal of places. Ferrari back ahead of BMW. It's changed on this lap. Their four laps have drifted the leaders. But interesting now, the Ferrari having taken the place, he's pulling away once more. This is how it happened, in fact, coming down towards La Source. BMW with rubber being spat out the back of it as it runs over some of the uh, rubber that's been chunked to one side on the road. That's on the outside at the source. Not a vast amount of defence put up there by Stefano Colombo. No, and uh, I mean, sometimes it's better to be sensible about it rather than fight. And uh, he knew that the Ferrari had that pace off the bus stop chicane, had the momentum and acceleration. And he decided not to make a big issue of it. There's still, say, six hours or so remaining of this race. And um, the uh, Ferrari just had the pace where it mattered. We've now got a new leader in Pro-Am, 59 Ferrari, which is Alex Mortimer at the wheel, former British GT champion. As we go back to Frank Eckler in the BMW, this car in fourth place, but being caught by Andre Lotterer in the Audi, and that was the Audi that took some time out in the pit garage, but uh, in the mirrors very shortly, well, there it is, there's the Audi of Andre Lotterer, just comes on to the camel straight proper itself. As the car now has got the BMW in its sights, and nothing better for a driver chasing than to see the gap close. Oh, and Kaka was spin. Andre Lotterer's got it all wrong, and Lake Coombe. I'm telling the world how good a job he's doing, and suddenly the back end on the entry into Lake Coombe rotates, and now he's stole the engine and all that hard work and good work for nothing. And Andre Lotterer doesn't do that very often. Very rarely. Yeah. It does just about get going again. Andre oh. Lotterer back into the race, but well, put that one in your diary, because you won't see it happen too often. To me, that's the shock of the race. <laughs> Look at the car shuddering. What is wrong? Is something mechanical? Is it something mechanical that's pitched or, him into the spin, like that's a right. puddle I mean, on the downshift or something There's something strange the going on with the car. Yeah. And that was on the downshift, and suddenly the car looks like it's extremely uh, problematic. That is a strange one. But, oh, big, big off there, and that's the Ferrari from AF Corsa from Pro-Am, and that is 50, I think I'm right in saying, which did lead early on. Louis Machiel's at the wheel of it. That's gone off at Eau Rouge. It is number 50, and that is a huge impact at Eau Rouge. The car's well out of the way. I don't think there's any debris on the road. Let's look at it again. He comes into the corner. He's oh, sideways something, coming into it. Something happens coming like down. The right rear, something went wrong, and that's where the car got out of control. And that's the nose that goes in heavily initially. So that's going to be a big impact indeed for... The driver, and now what it was on that right rear, we don't know, but you could suddenly see the car swerved as the back end lost grip completely, and then it was just simply a passenger. Uh, the tyre barrier doing a very, very good job, but concerns from the team as they look at the replay. Let's look at it again. The Ferrari comes down. The old pit straight, start, finish straight, just makes the turn, and even before he's com committed to the apex, the car is out of shape and is rotating and just does a 360 and then the nose heavily into the tyre barrier and uh, well that will have to be reconstructed of it certainly it looks like it's had a mighty bang and safety that, car. Yeah, the safety car will be deployed. That's good news, Louis Mackey is limping a bit. I'm not surprised. Surprised. Well, that was, a, that was yeah. a big, big shunt. And uh, again, that's the benefit of these tyre barriers and the tyre the, the bailing that holds them all together. They took a big old rattle. Hopefully they haven't been displaced too much. But safety car being deployed, it hasn't been deployed very much this weekend and hasn't been out for quite a long time. Ricard Leitz has pitted on plan on lap 452. Can this car get out without being delayed? That will be the ultimate factor as to who's going to win this race. So there is Ben Schneider. So he's come past the, uh, the, the Formula One pits down the hill. And there is the Porsche waiting and that's going to go a lap down. It looks of it. Absolutely. It's going to lose a lap and that is all over. Kind of answer the question now. Never yep. mind the strategy. If you're a lap down, then that is bad, bad news. It will get them their lap back when the Mercedes pits, but that won't be for another 26, 27 laps time. But they've now been released, mm. uh, so, but it's unfortunate for Richard Leitz, and uh, in fact it's not just Pierre Pillay back in the car, that uh, the opportunity to make the pit stop and uh, the delay at the end of the pit lane while the chain of cars goes through there. Again, we see what happens. There's two safety car deployments per lap, 
And if one of those two safety car deployments is anywhere close mm. to a pit lane exit, then you will be delayed until the crocodile has gone through. This is the Mercedes-Benz we're looking at. Maximilian Gertz in that car. And pretty much since the middle of the night, the Mercedes-Benz has taken control, albeit in a great battle with the Porsche 150, driven right now by Richard Leitz, but that car did have to suffer a penalty for overtaking, apparently under the safety car. Indeed so, and the penalty applied because the overtake had come before the safety car line. Now here's the replay of it, look top right, you'll see the Porsche. We were impressed by the move at the time. Look at the way that the Porsche swings through the traffic. Now look at the white line there, that is the safety car line, and you can't overtake until you get to that line. So even though the safety car had pulled off, you can't overtake until you get to the line, and that's why 150 got the drive-through penalty. Well, I mean, that's the rules and regulations are for, and with television all around the racetracks these days, Everything is noted in a way it certainly wouldn't have been years ago. Now, also in the last few hours, there's not just been that drive-through penalty that's affected the overall classification, but also there was quite a sizable accident that took out number 17 Ferrari and the 16 Audi, Enzo Ede at the wheel. Now look here, the Audi tries to move back, having lapped the Ferrari and take the line for the corner, and he completely misjudges it, charges the Ferrari off into the barrier, and that sad to say, is the end of the Ferrari. Ian Dockrell was the man behind the wheel. Now, as he goes down out of the piff path, have a look, the Audi is on the right-hand side, and Enzo Ede goes ahead, but he just seems to misjudge where the Ferrari was as he tried to cut across and take the line for the next corner. Both drivers OK, but, John, that a big, big accident. I mean, heavy, heavy damage to the front of the Audi. Enzo Ede gets out of the car. Ferrari also severe front-end damage. I mean, and probably, to be honest, Enzo, he did not need to move from right to left because of the situation that he was in. He had control of the corner and he was just being too ambitious and thinking that he was going to get the race line into what is now Campus Corner. A um, mistake on the part of Enzo Eid and an expensive one for both the Audi and Ferrari team. Out of speaker's corner, up over the curves goes Kekler, but the Audi is right there and threatening. Yes, it is, and looking to have dive down the inside. Be ambitious to do it down there because the BMW is a high downforce car. It can afford to go deeper into the corner, but it gets wide on the exit of Puho and now has been challenged side by side into Fan. Kekler is on the inside line. Is Mies going to go around the outside? Yes, he is. Brave effort that on the outside line. He's ahead as he gets to the apex for the first part of the piff path. Through he goes. And so that puts the Audi now up into fourth. And rather disgruntled Vita 4 1 engineers look at a car that's down in fifth. There, I'm afraid to say, is a problem coming into the pits. That is Stefano Colombo. And it's ground to a halt, almost like it's run out of fuel at pit in. And there the team having to run down. Now, it is an uphill incline as well. Indeed, you can't really push a car down the pit lane, but for safety reasons, the team will be allowed to get that out of the way. So Stefano Colombo is into the pit lane, and you can see what a heavy car it is because the marshals are wilting a bit now. And there's a lot of weight to heave around there. But why has the car ground to a halt? It looks as though it's something more serious than that. There we see the third... Is this the third place? Yes, that's, it is. that's smoking. That car's got a problem. Look that's, at the smoke coming out of the back of it. That says our Ramos in third place down the pit lane, and it's a rather smoky Ferrari. The BMW look is being pushed to the team, but that's the car that was running fifth with Strive, and now this is the third place car. Is this the end, I wonder, because there's flame from the back. The extinguishers are quickly there. They had a pit lane fire at Paul Ricard, and now the car that was in third place comes into the pit lane with the engine, one fears, perhaps having let go, and is that the end of the Castle Racing Ferrari? Well, there's certainly been a caused by liquids most likely that will be oil whether it's transmission oil or engine oil and uh, what a disappointment that car is running competitively in third place five laps down on the lead car but one lap ahead of Andre Lotterer in the number two Audi who will inherit that there was a one lap gap there is the car that will now go on and take for provisionally the final podium position as the Audi fifth on the end of the previous lap, now fourth with the demise of the Ferrari. So, Jack, a lot's been happening in the pit lane in the last few minutes, hasn't it? Uh, Michael Bartel's very pleasant to me, but he says that he doesn't know what the problem is. They're looking for the problem at the moment. And actually, uh, Colombo has just climbed out of the car. They're all shaking hands. So it looks to me as though this car may be out of the race, the kind of body language yeah. of the mechanics and driver. And this is all being well, the last pit stop for the Mercedes. A brand new set of rubber going on for Baron Schneider. That'll be a nice little experience. 
and uh, I'll take a little note of his first flying lap on these tyres. Well, don't forget, he's got the best lap yes. of the race already. I'm just thinking, just can he go even quicker? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the very thought I had. <laughs> he's got a 221.861, which he set on, what, lap 467. And we are in lap 540, so he was well in. It was probably in the, the best part of the 21st hour when he set that lap. So we now we will leave the pit lane, and uh, that's the long way down as we see the Porsche coming up through Eau Rouge as Bernd Schneider was probably rounding and then making the trip down the European uh, pit lane. Lights flashing on the Porsche as it makes its way past one of the Mercedes, and uh, Patrick Pile still pushing as hard as he can to 24.6 was his last lap. A little bit maybe premature to be congratulating it. might be just a great pit stop. That's what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. They're not congratulating yeah. themselves on a victory, but uh, on a great pit stop. And that's Fred Booby, who is still leading despite the drive-through penalty, the gentleman trophy. And it's a good job that the penalty wasn't more draconian, I think, for them. The total 24 hours of Spa of 2013 is won by HTP Motorsports, by Mercedes, by Maximilian Gertz, Maximilian Book. And Ben Schneider, who accelerates up towards the line. Mercedes wins the Spa 24 hours of 2013. Victory to Ben Schneider, Maximilian Buch and Maximilian Goetz. The door is opened. A delighted Ben Schneider punches the air, waves to the mechanics to say thanks for all your efforts and to congratulate them as well as he heads down towards La Source. There's another checkered flag still to be waved. The ceremonial finish of the event. You can't overtake until you get there. You have to stay in order and the Maximilians straight away face the media in the pit lane. They'll go to the podium. We'll hear from them, I'm sure, with John Watson very shortly. John's made his way down there to be part of the victory celebrations and very happy scenes. We've been so used for the last couple of years to seeing the Audi part of the pit lane, the real centre of attention. Not this year. Mercedes comes out on top. That is going to be a very important win for marketing purposes back home. And for Bert Schneider, having won in Dubai in 24 hours earlier in the year, he's won the Nürburgring 24, the Bathurst 12 hours. He now adds the Spa 24-hour victory to that list as well. What a season for a man who's theoretically retired from racing. Here's the second place car. Well, sadly, in the last three or four hours of the race, the Manti Porsche had to accept defeat against the Mercedes, but Mark Lieb, Patrick Pile, and Richard Leitz have given it their all. The car just not quite as quick as the Mercedes. Home it will come, second overall, second in the Pro Cup, and again, a superb effort from everybody connected to that team. Let's see what sort of reaction the AF Corsa Ferrari gets. A single finger in the air. P1 in Pro-Am for Tony Villander for AF Corsa. And big cheers as he comes across the timing line. Bert Schneider bumps his head as he gets out from under the gullwing door. Stands on top of the Mercedes. And Bert Schneider celebrates a second win in the Spa 24 hours. A delighted man. John Watson is down there to have a word with Bernd Schneider after winning the Spa 24 hours, John. Bernd Schneider, you and the two Maxes have won Spa 24. How good is that? Unbelievable. It was an amazing race. Such a hard battle. And uh, we all were really exhausted uh, after the, the, whole, the long night. And uh, no, it was amazing. The team made a fantastic job. The car was outstanding. The car was perfect. We could push and diving as hard as I could, and uh, the car survived, and we survived, and we are really happy. Max, congratulations, fantastic effort. All three of you, flawless race. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was my first time here in Spa, and we won directly, so it's crazy also for Max, the first time here, and to win uh, in the first year, so it's unbelievable. Well, there's two Maxis in this team, two youngsters. Maximilian Book, congratulations. What does winning 24 hours, the total Spa 24 hour race, mean to you? Uh, a lot. I cannot really say something about it now because it's so amazing. We didn't really expect that. We just came here to uh, show a good performance from our side and now we are first. And, yeah, unbelievable. Well, you two gentlemen and your senior driver, go and enjoy yourself and celebrate tonight. Let's confirm how they came across the line, the provisional classification then. It's a win for HTP Motorsport. Bert Schneider, Maximilian Buch and Maximilian Goetz win the total 24 hours of Spa for 2013. Ahead of Mark Lieb, Richard Leitz and Patrick Pile. Third, Andre Lodra, Christopher Mies and Frank Stippler. Fourth goes the way of Harold Primat, Oliver Jarvis and Christopher Hasser. In fifth place, 
It is the Ferrari of Tony Villander, Matt Griffin, Duncan Cameron and Alex Mortimer, the head of Mika Salo, Kira Ladijin, Victor Shaita and Maurizio Mediani. Seventh, Lucas Odoniev, Jan Mardenborough, Peter Pizzera and Wolfgang Reip. Eighth, Klaus Hummel, Steve Jans, Adam Christodoulou and Thomas Jaeger. Good result for them. Uh, ninth behind them, Pro Speed Porsche. Tenth was SMP Racing. And as you look lower down the order, a number of these cars among the walking wounded. But definitely a big cheer for 16th overall for the winners of the Gentleman Trophy. Fred Bouvy, Patrice Guellard, Jean-Luc Blanchemin and Jean-Luc Bobelic bring home the winning car ahead of Sport Garage 52, Kessel Racing 1-1-1. But in each case, Ferrari 458 Italias coming home successfully in the Gentleman Trophy as the trophy is brought forward and we also have the impressive Blancpain clock as well that is presented to Maximilian Buch, Maximilian Goetz and Ben Schneider as the winners of the 2013 total 24 hours of Spa. Pro-Am honours go the way of Matt Griffin, Duncan Cameron, Alex Mortimer and Tony Villander. Jerome Polycon, a very happy team boss as Sofrev ASP wins the Gentleman Trophy in the total 24 hours of Spa. The champagne is sprayed, the Gentleman Trophy podium here is complete. And it has been another superb race in the total 24 hours of Spa's history. From all of us at Spa, we hope you've enjoyed the coverage. Join us at the Nürburgring for the final round of the championship for now. It's time for a Belgian beer and goodbye.